we're going to move on to our new panel on academic OSPOs. Um, for, uh, uh, I'll just do a quick introduction of our moderator, Elizabeth Wu, or Liz, as we all know her, um, and, then, um, and then let her take away the introductions with the rest. Now, uh, Liz Wu is the program associate for technology programs at the Alfred P. P. Sloan Foundation, who's one of our main sponsors. Um, and also one of our funders for our OSP, OSPO project. Um, and there, and among other focus areas, she supports grant making and better software for science. Um, prior to joining the foundation, Liz co-founded Learning Equality, a nonprofit organization focused on equity in education technology, supporting active uh, projects in over 30 countries globally. Prior to that, Liz was a NDSEG uh, fellow at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, yay Tritons, um, applying uh, technological innovation to bioacoustic research. So Liz, I'll let you take it there. Great, and it took me a bit of time, um, just confirming you can hear me. Great, awesome. So I've pinned the speaker's table to my Zoom, and then I also see the Haybarn um, feed in the corner and then I also have my moderator notes so you know <laughs> please please be patient with me as I navigate all the windows um, and Stephanie if I could ask you just to help with uh, monitoring the chat and sure, no back that'd be great thank you so hi everyone I'm Liz um, so as Stephanie said I'm a program associate at the Sloan Foundation for those of you who aren't aware of the Sloan Foundation we're a, a private foundation based in New York City that's where I'm connecting from today um, and we primarily fund basic research in the natural and social sciences. And as a part of the technology program at Sloan, um, our program team thinks about the digital tools that researchers use in their day-to-day -day work. And because we have a specific program area called Better Software for Science, you can conclude that there's a strong focus on, on software and the, the kinds of software that matter to researchers and for the production of knowledge. So, you know, more recently, we've thought about the role of open source um, in the research enterprise and, um, and, you know, something I have to clarify with a lot of our colleagues here at Sloan is that when we say open source, we don't just mean the license choice, but rather, you know, a phrase that's come to me in a set of norms and practices that enable distributed development and maintenance of a code base. And I think based on the panels and the, the keynotes today that everyone in this room is pretty aligned with that understanding of open source. It's more than just the license, but rather a way of doing. Um, and, you know, the idea is that if you use open source as a lens on research software, um, open source practices can produce more sustainable and trustworthy software for science, something we probably need more than ever trustworthy science. And um, at the same time in doing in, you know, in supporting this kind of work, we hope to incentivize the kinds of labor that isn't usually visibly valued in research and you know very specific, uh, academic term, you know like um, labor towards tenure. Um, so we're hoping that in supporting open source we can make that more visible and ultimately make software more broadly useful and durable. So since 2020, we've been pursuing the cultivation of, of OSPOs within university settings as a, as a strategy to institutionalize support for open source software on campuses. Um, and I know some of the people in the audience are involved in industry OSPOs. So I'll just briefly admit that we totally took an inspiration from you <laughs> um, and especially the to-do group um, you know, seeing how well established this feature, this OSPO feature is in successful companies, we, we took inspiration and we wondered about applying that to the university setting. Um, and, you know, some of the, the um, things we wanted to see from applying an OSPO model, I'm sure our panelists will, will touch on and discuss, but I'll briefly list them. Um, you know, the training and support for faculty and students who want to grow local software efforts into healthy open source projects, you know, continuing to improve on understanding how to best contribute to those projects. Um, and then also documenting, um, tracking, me measuring impact in the value of open source work. Um, and then perhaps most challengingly in, 
importantly, facilitating relationships between, um, you know, an OSPO and the other academic units that exist on campus, like technology transfer, research computing, or the library. Um, and so, yeah, since 2020, we've been, you know, exploring academic OSPOs as a thing, um, trying to pitch that internally for our board of, board of trustees to approve a succession of grants. To date, uh, the Board of Trustees has approved six grants to support nascent university OSCOs. So I'll list them Johns Hopkins, Rector Institute of, um, of Technology, I was about to say of Oceanography, <laughs> um, University of Vermont, UC Santa Cruz, St. Louis University, and most recently Carnegie Mellon. You'll recognize those names because they're represented by the panelists. It's my pleasure to say that um, this group of panelists, if they're all here today, um, covers all of the OSPOs that we've supported at Sloan. And, and I know um, permutations of these panelists have presented in the past month at, at other uh, events, but I think this is the first time all of, you know, all of the OSPOs are represented at one time on one panel. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and so just to briefly touch on what we've supported in the grants, we specifically provided funds for core capacity to launch the OSPO or, you know, to, to, to officially launch an OSPO, even if a program was already doing OSPO-like activities prior to the funding. Um, so core support for that, but then also targeted funds for specific programmatic activities, uh, which really leverage the specific resources and leverages the specific personalities of each institution. Um, and a key deliverable in each of the grants will be a playbook, writing up that specific program. And one of our goals at, here at Sloan is to really have this high level view once these playbooks are being written to support a library of such playbooks so that you know, another university might pick and choose depending on local contexts when they might consider launching their own OSPO. Um, and so, of course, you know, having a library is really immensely valuable, but there's even more value in having these key people sitting together at the same time discussing the unique challenges of each context. And that's really the goal for our, our, our hour today. Um, you know, the least of which is to just introduce you to the different OSPOs, because, you know, there are six, five, five people here. And so there, there's a lot to track in terms of just being introduced to each institution and the unique activities at each. But um, I'm hoping we could also spend the majority of our hour to discuss the important challenges um, and thoughts on how to approach them. Um, and so, you know, this is abundantly clear, but each panelist today represents very unique institutions. And, you know, when I think of unique, I think they are schools of different sizes of, you know, different number of students. Um, uh, different demographics of students, um, schools with very different missions. So um, I'll stop there because I'm sure the panelists can go deeper into what their unique institutions are all about. Um, uh, and, and we'll start with introductions. Um, I'll invite each panelist to introduce uh, themselves, but also a bit more about their OSPO. We'll move into a few questions that I uh, pre-wrote, but um, at the end, we will open up the floor for questions from you. So yes, Stephanie will be monitoring the chat for me since I can't multitask and please feel free to just, you know, line them up for us. Um, all right, so uh, we'll go uh, out as I can also, as I call you up, I'll in in invite you to one, introduce yourselves, um, to introduce your OSPO, you know, where it's at and the main activities, some of the hallmarks. And then three, a brief summary of the main gaps, main challenges that you are addressing. And just a very kind reminder to just stick to the challenges because later on in our Q&A section, we'll, we'll talk about maybe potential solutions. Um, so I will first invite Saeed. Thanks, Liz. Uh, I'm Saeed Chaudhary. I'm the director of the OSPO at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I've been there two months. Um, <laughs> still literally and figuratively learning where the restrooms are and so on. Um, I 
also was at Hopkins for many years where I started the hospital there. So some of what I talked about may be in that context, but I, I don't represent Hopkins anymore. Uh, I'm glad to know Bill Brandon's on the call. He's sort of taken on that role now that I've left, uh, but I don't expect him to, to jump in unless I say something I shouldn't. Uh, so Hopkins and Carnegie Mellon are both so-called R1 research intensive universities. They're both private institutions, uh, relatively small in terms of overall number of students. Uh, but relatively large in terms of overall budgets associated for, for research, uh, particularly funding from the federal government. Um, both institutions, uh, I think, have a reasonable case for arguing that they have impact on the national, maybe even global scale. Uh, for example, Carnegie Mellon's president was at the White House for the signing of the CHIPS bill. I'm assuming you don't get invited to the White House unless you have some influence or impact uh, in, in doing something like that. So it, it's in that context uh, that we're thinking about the OSPO in, in this sort of profile of institution. Um, in terms of challenges, I, I'll start with a very high level one that we can drill into uh, over the course of the discussion. Uh, Stephen had a slide if you heard his talk, but there's a startling lack of understanding of open source software and production. Uh, I'll, I'll channel that statement and say, there's a startling lack of understanding about open source as a primary research object within universities. Um, and that might seem somewhat shocking to hear, but I, I think we can talk about that more. Particularly how open source software as a research object can be used for new forms of education, like we've heard about earlier, uh, and maybe even more importantly, new forms of translation in terms of impact uh, of research and education beyond the walls of the university. Uh, and how universities can work, can work with each other in new ways, work with the private sector and work with the public sector. A lot of that work reflects things we've been doing through a, a group called Possible Plus Plus, which is another thing we can dive into a little bit more. Awesome. And Saeed, because um, I'm always interested in the individual, did you want to share a little bit of your personal background too? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> so uh, I've been working in libraries for many years. Um, I, by the time I left Hopkins, was a, an administrator, uh, an associate dean, running a, a group looking at digital infrastructure for open scholarship and open science. Uh, background, though, is trained as an engineer. Been mostly in universities uh, throughout my career, except for two years where I worked with the United Nations uh, in Bangladesh, which is where I was born. Great. Yeah, I mean, especially in your your background as a uh, working in libraries, it, it really helps to give context to the lens you have in thinking about what should be primary research objects. Um, all right, so next, I'd like to invite Kendall. Can you hear me? I want to make sure my volume is good. Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I am at the University of Vermont. Um, it is the largest uh, school in the state of Vermont. With about eleven thousand, or um, yeah, eleven thousand students, which is like an eighth of the population of the the biggest town in Vermont. So we're a small state overall. Um, we're a land grant institution, so we have uh, per, um, you know goals inside of our university to connect with the community and with the state at large. Um, I am in my fifth month, um, and we were funded by Sloan at the beginning of the year. So I'm five months into this, and um, what I'm learning is that quarterly plans are what you can look at to realize what you didn't think was going to happen. Because uh, each time it's been changing and modifying, which has honestly been a lot of fun. Um, our primary challenge that we're kind of looking at is one, just the landscape. Like, I, I in my experience so far, it's been hard to find people that have a good grasp on like what's being done, where, what is open, what is not when it comes to research. Um, and then in the broader community, those people needing those resources to do what they're going to do is part of the conversations I've been having is talking to like different research organizations inside of you, the state of Vermont and be like, do you know what's been done here? How do we bring that forward? Um, do we know how much of our research is actually open, those pieces? Um, additionally, with a lot of you know, student outreach and connecting with them around the fun parts of what we're talking about um, and the ideas of how we build community programs and projects that they can engage with, with our community partners and um, bring new, new things to light. Um, I was hoping to go the last because I think everyone else is going to be much smarter than me. So I'll just you know, tag onto them when they're done too. And also maybe a little bit about your background too. Sure. Um, I spent the last 12 years working in tech. Um, I'm a word person that started in fine arts and ended up working in technology uh, in a, a massive collection of roles. I was a product manager last fit, taught myself Python, um, which is why I thought I knew what open source was. Learned that there's so much more. 
Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I've been in, like, this is the first time I've been in an academic setting. Uh, I've been in private industry until this moment. So I'm learning what that looks like. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next we have SJ. Hi, I'm Steve Jacobs. Um, I am hold a master's degree in media theory, which means that I am a potential filmmaker or media critic gone horribly, horribly wrong. And I have ended up as somehow as a full professor in one of the largest colleges of computing in the world. Um, I've just dumped a whole bunch of links in here because I'm going to dump a whole lot of stuff really quick and then move on. So we started teaching a single class in open source um, in 2009, which grew to a full minor and something that RIT follows calls an immersion, which is three course collections and a five course collection in how to become a contributor to RIT. Um, Mel Chua was one of the first people who helped me put that together. Um, uh, hello to Mel and hello to Jordan, who I don't know, and thanks to the interpreters. Um, so with that background, we put together a proposal first to my college, the university, and then to the Sloan Foundation to open uh, what was then the, the second OSPO, because Saeed's a, you know, in Maryland or DC was the first, Johns Hopkins. And um, we've been working for two years at that. Um, one of the links I dropped in this links I dropped in there is there's an open work definition because our approach to our OSPO is really that it's an open program office that supports open work. We have a much broader kind of view than kind of focused on software in and of itself. Um, because I have faculty who are doing or want to do open work in the humanities, in the arts, so on and so forth. And when we set up shop, I didn't want to be a blocker, have the name be a blocker and have people, well, I don't do software, I'm not a computing, you know, and, and keep them out of what we're trying to do. Um, unlike Hopkins, who, to my knowledge anyway, had a very robust set of things in place around the larger pieces of open science and open data and policies and so on and so forth. We did not, so we're trying to kind of manage that stuff as well. We're a private institution, but we, um, we've only been getting serious about research in the past 20 years, research with a capital R. So we're an R2, not an R1. We don't generate enough PhD students to be an R1. A lot of my challenges running the OSPO is still, even after two years, just getting people to clue in on what, what's open about open and how that should affect ideally tenure and promotion, i.e. if you're managing a community of that is supporting open source software, but you're not writing the software or you're not publishing journal articles about the software, you don't exist in a lot of academic world situations. You're not getting credit for tenure, you're not getting credit for motion. If you're spending all your time managing a group of contributors that are propping up, let's say R, or something that's pretty much critical to scholarship at this point. So we're trying to work around that. We just held a uh, summit on open work in academia about a month ago, where we got a whole group of people from some of these people here not only the OSPO people, but Karsten who came and talked about open work and Liz and Josh from Sloan, Stephanie was on the panel um, that was about academic OSPOs to try and start kicking around ideas and overlaps between industry and academia because industry also has questions about how to credit the non-code GitHub statable work that people do in open source. So we're working at that um to kind of do some work on that one of the links in that thing i dumped into the chat is called it's an article about something called mystic which is an add-on or an adaptation of the chaos grimoire lab software that tries to pull community metrics we're working with them to um try to build an academic metrics so people can find ways to convince their tenure and promotion committees that you know i really do stuff that's important 
So you talked about software not being recognized much as scholarship yet. I dropped a link to the MIT legal journal article on software being scholarship. It's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's a big conversation. Saeed is uh, very motivated to work on that and we're happy to help him. We don't have a link on our website that says playbook, but if you go to the Open at RIT website link in there, you'll find sections that say best practices, faculty and staff and students that talk about a lot of those issues. One of our challenges is going to be moving our best practices into policy. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. And I, I'm just going to cut you off because I know you're encroaching on the, you know, offering some solutions that you've already worked on over the last two years for the challenges. And so I'm going to invite you to say even more, um, but I'm hoping to allow Carlos and then um, Danny to introduce themselves. So Carlos. Yes, thank you, Liz. Um, so I'm Carlos Malzahn. I'm faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Um, my core area is actually storage systems and distributed systems. Uh, so in general, experimental computer systems. Um, so I actually started here in Santa Cruz, or UC Santa Cruz in uh, January 2005. And before that, I was a performance engineer at NetApp, which is a storage company that still is um, you know, producing high-end storage systems. Um, uh, so I come sort of from a background both in practice as well as um, uh, you know academic. I got a PhD at uh, CU Boulder, um, uh, and then in 2008 I became adjunct faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Um, from the very beginning of my time at UC Santa Cruz, I was involved in a project that turned into Ceph, uh, which is a very widely used uh, today uh, open source distributed storage system uh, and was uh, one of the key mentors of Sage Weil, uh, who was the PhD student at that point who created this project. Um, and that should pretty much that project formed my career um, because it was uh, ended up being a very successful open source project that came out of academia, right? So the span from 2005 to 2015 um, uh, turned into like a $175 million sale of a startup company uh, from the you know, first line of code written uh, and, and then deciding to open source the project. Uh, this is, um, uh, this created essentially the, the foundation for, um, for CROSS, the Center for Research and Open Source Software, uh, which I founded in 2014. And um, which was, uh, you know, from the very beginning, looking at sort of the career of successful open source PhD students, right, who turned their project into open source, uh, and identified three elements. One was, you know, teaching uh, more students to be uh, productive in open source communities. The second was to fund. Um, projects that have a plausible path to open source, um, uh, open source projects. And then the third one was an incubator that was possibly the most innovative part, an incubator for postdocs to grow communities around the research products. Um, we raised an enormous amount of money because we were set up as a research center and it was all focused around storage systems research. Um, but we tried to broaden it um, because the university uh, and every one of us actually felt the need that there was more to it than just that particular research area. And so uh, when we uh, eventually met, ran into, actually it was um, Nithya, Nithya Raff who introduced us to the OSPO++ Plus um, Plus uh, crowd. And we had that first conversation with uh, uh, Jacob Green, um, who is I think the founder of OSPO++ Plus Plus, and he uh, convinced us that we should be thinking really, and this is like six years into CROSS, we should be thinking uh, of CROSS in terms of an OSPO. Um, and that kind of was a, one of those watershed moments where a lot of things became clear to us. <laughs> and furthermore, uh, the OSPO++ Plus Plus also connected us to the Alfred P. Stone Foundation and we were uh, able to get funded. Uh, 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 an effort to actually establish an OSPO here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so UC Santa Cruz uh, is a 
public university. Um, it is part of maybe the largest university in the world, 10 campuses, the University of California. Um, uh, it is um, itself um, made a name uh, of various things, among others, it was uh, David Hausler here at UC Santa Cruz, who um, was the first sequencer of the human genome and decided to open source the human genome. Um, and so we have a tradition here to, to you know, open source things, um, but also because uh, bioengineering and genomic institute uh, are usually connected to a university hospital and UC Santa Cruz doesn't have one of those. So the entire culture here is to reach out to other universities and be very collaborative. Um, so we just uh, started, you know, the OSPO uh, in January this year. Um, we are uh, definitely highly leveraging some of the programs that we developed at CROSS. Um, but we actually were able to sort of focus CROSS more on particular research topics and then make the OSPO the, the organization that does these cross organizational programs. Um, one of the things that we learned at CROSS uh, that we also took over as, as sort of the mantra at OSPO, and I talked about this this morning too, is that we see definitely open source as a means to an end to amplify uh, uh, research. You know, and, 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 and as an as a alternative uh, pathway for technologies. Um, and this is very much um, compatible with the mission of the University of California, which is teaching, uh, research, and public service. And it's the public service part where basically where the translation has to happen. Right? That is actually a core mission of the university. Um, so the three uh, gaps that we identified um, are, again, you know, how do you uh, get students to be more productive in open source communities? So really uh, focus on teaching that and, and training. Uh, the second thing is that we found that the university has very little idea of the value of open source. And we found that the funding we received in CROSS really change so sort of the awareness of the role that open source can pay, can play, right? So this, this is, and so we learned that actually money is a really good metric uh, for, for, for showing importance of something. So what we're hoping to achieve is um, to kind of reveal the funding streams that are open source related throughout the UC system. And then the third thing is um, that we, you know, think that open source is a fantastic tool to achieve broad engagement with industry, you know, foundation and, and government. Um, so these are the three gaps that we see that, that we want to address um, with programs. And I can definitely talk more about the programs. Thank you. Well articulated. And then last but not least, we have Danny from SLU. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Just checking my audio. Yep. Sounds great. Awesome. I'm uh, Daniel Schoen, I'm from St. Louis University. Uh, we are a Jesuit university right in the middle of the US, right along the Mississippi. We're the oldest university um, west of Mississippi, founded in 1818. Um, so we're over 200 years old, um, which gives us some unique perspective on cycles. Uh, I think the, the discussion that Carson had earlier was, I, I appreciated that. Um, I have been with this university for over 16 years in various roles, uh, most of them staff roles of one sort or another, uh, largely involved with the IT organization. Um, and then I left for a while uh, to go and work in industry for the last eight years where I did a lot of software development, um, a lot of software operations, uh, sort of the DevOps space. Um, and uh, came back as an adjunct in the CS department uh, in the fall and our OSPO started in July of this summer. So um, I guess I can claim that we're, I've, I've been going at it longer than Saeed has at Carnegie Mellon, but <laughs> uh, I'm maybe one of the, the newest overall uh, of, of any of the OSPOs, we're running one of the newest OSPOs overall. Um, 
we have uh, we're a university that is also hard to like like uh, Rochester and uh, but has aspirations of, of growing our research profile. Um, one of the last things that I was engaged with at the university prior to leaving for a while uh, was being on a president's advisory council and research came up as sort of a thing that they wanted to do uh, and you needed to figure out how to do well, how to do better than they were already doing. And um, I came back to an organization that had uh, a new office of EPA research um, that has been re really wonderfully supportive in getting this OSPO set up and, and seeing the value and the opportunities that having uh, a, an organization like this within the university provides. Um, the challenges that we specifically set out to tackle uh, are really, there's, there's sort of two big ones that we wanted to tackle immediately. One is just sort of uh, providing tools for researchers that we have on campus. Um, research writ large, but specifically our researchers. Um, and then also the other was giving our students uh, a realistic uh, software development experience. Um, our initial program is really built around giving students a realistic software development experience by creating and maintaining research software. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, I also, I, th I think of sort of our role um, as a Jesuit university is distinct from many of the other organizations that have have got um, representation here. Um, we have, I think, an opportunity to be a gateway to how to set this sort of organization up at other Catholic and Jesuit universities, um, which for me is fun. I've always, I don't happen to be Catholic or even Christian, uh, but it's uh, the values and whatnot you know, we, we like to engage with community and we've got a good, um, yeah. So, uh, awesome. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I appreciate the attention to the, you know, establishing the context of your, um, of your, you know, different institutions and, and what I heard, uh, during your intros, especially in articulating the challenges is that there are some overlaps between what you shared. You know, we heard, um, some challenges that are probably related to um, uh, an OSPO being very young and new on campus, which is just the landscaping of, of what open source is actually happening, the landscaping of the understanding of open by current researchers, um, you know, that and, and overall needs for awareness and outreach across campus. So that was something articulated as a challenge. And then, and then I imagine the other challenges brought up come with maturity in, in OSPO, which is thinking about open source as a primary research object, thinking about, you know, measuring the value of open source, whether that's in money, like Carlos said, or towards promotion and tenure, like what SJ said. So yeah, I, I'm hearing some common challenges. And so I'll open up with um, the first question, which is broad and anyone can go in any order to answer, but you know, what are, what is your approach to address the gaps you identified? Um, what gaps do you see your OSPO filling? Um, jump in. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so we uh, started with a fairly um, straightforward and um, direct approach to tackling uh, how do we give students a more realistic software development experience? And we basically have restructured our capstone course for our CS majors. Um, I think there's still work to be done in closing that gap in terms of what does real look like, but we actually have small teams uh, with uh, mentorship. They happen to be internal mentors, graduate students, uh, guiding each of our small teams, um, giving sort of more realistic tech lead and team of junior developers sort of experience that even if it's not open source, uh, a new software developer in, in industry might encounter. Um, and we're slowly growing what making it more real looks like. Um, so that's that was step one for us. Great, and I'll just point out to you that because of the size, the scale of the CS department at SLU, 
Um, I think it, your, the restructuring of your program means you're touching basically every CS major at SLU, which is yeah. maybe something none of the other OSCOs here can say. Um, can it, um, anyone else like to share their, how they've um, filled their gaps? I can say like for UVM, um, a lot of the way we approach it is a design process. Like there are elements we all bring to the the job that we think, you know, this is the way that things are. And, and a lot of the work we've been doing is doing interviews and surveys and trying to ask the community what they actually need. Um, and some of that is network crawling where like I start with one person, I'm like, okay, that was a good, cool conversation. Who else should I talk to? And I think at this point, I'm like 75 different people I've talked to in the last five months. Um, and all those, like, I think the exception of three, all those are references from others. And that's led to uh, seven different class lecture, guest lecturing processes I'm gonna do and like a handful of potential projects and that kind of thing. So there's a bit of an organic grow that's happening just to find the people that are doing this work. Um, and sometimes I get to someone and like, oh yeah, like I, I think I know you from some other part and I kind of connect it back too. Um, and I've been mapping those, those connections and those people along the process too. So I can always reference back to it to know and find those resources later when someone says, oh, I'm doing this thing and I can connect them back to it. Um, and there's definitely resource connection pieces too within the community where having worked in industry and the community, like I know a lot of the tech people and connecting the stuff they're working on with like things that I know are now, I now know are happening at UVM and being like, okay, you guys should talk about this. There's ways to connect that, that, that like network, networking across the community has been something that's been growing too as I start to explore that more and more. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll add that that sort of landscape analysis is critical, I think, in any university for any any OSPO. It will be different in the different contexts, which you probably hear more about. Um, one thing I'll add to that is it's been very important, at least at the institutions where I've, I've, I've been working on this, to point out that there are these sort of three primary research objects, articles, data, and software. Um, and that when it comes to articles, there's a very well-developed kind of ecosystem, right? For, for how you produce them, disseminate them. And there are actually connections between universities, the government, and the private sector in, in that as well. Not, not so much around data. It starts to be a little bit more fragmented, a little bit less clear. Um, the irony is that most universities in this context are producing a ton of open source software, and it's already out there. Many faculty members are just depositing their software GitHub repos, uh, and it's available. So I think being able to tell the administrators in particular, right, that you already have researchers producing open source software, already care about it, already use it in education. There are places where this is happening, but there's no institutional strategy around this. <laughs> and there's no institutional infrastructure around this. Uh, and there's no intentionality around this. And, and they're already putting it out there. You, what is open is one of the questions, right? Well, if a faculty member is putting their software in GitHub, it's open, whether it's been run through tech transfer, whether it's been run through you know, the, the grants office or whatever. So just raising the awareness that there's already a tremendous amount of these research outputs, they're already out there. They're not being managed in any kind of intentional way. Uh, has the useful benefit of getting some people a little agitated um, in, in, in good and maybe not so good ways? Uh, but also getting the researchers very engaged in, in saying, yes, I'd like you to help me solve this problem. So this, this was an actual exchange I had with someone at Hopkins. Um, he was the chair of a committee that was set up to deal with this from the School of Engineering. He said, nobody tells me what to do with my articles. Nobody tells me what to do with my data. Why should someone tell me what to do with my software? Uh, and then he said, but I need help with my software. I, I don't know how to manage it. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to train my students. So I think that's been an important part of trying to cast the OSPOs as a useful service. Yeah, and, and just to add on to what Aid says, I mean, we all have the problem of even being able to find out what the heck is out there. You know, computing professors, not lots of other professors, have been creating open source software for 20 years, give or take. There is no way to find it. You know, you can you can try to do, you know, hardcore GitHub screen scrape and you know, dot rit dot edu um, 
email addresses, you know, but you don't have to use their email address. And, and then students, right? We have, at least in our context, and maybe in some of the other university contexts, we really have three different types of, of clients, right? There are staff. Staff have, to, staff have to follow policy, whatever it is, about whatever it is, because the university is their boss. Uh, in theory, anyway. Uh, students at RIT own their own IP, so they can do whatever they want with it whenever they want. That's not the case in a lot of most research institutions don't own their own IP. Um, Faculty are in this free area where yes, they're employed by the university, but yes, they also have a mission and a mandate and some federal regulation support to make their work open, to share their work, especially if they've been funded by the federal government or someone like Sloan or some other place. So it's, it's kind of a bumpy road to try to figure out you know, where are, where are we on that spectrum from, you know, Saeed's classic professor, don't tell me what to do, but oh God, please help me, right? You know, you've got all these different things that are going on that make it very different in a corporate context. And, and one of the things that we don't have policy at RIT that really fits this, we have our standard kind of IP policy, right? But of releasing things openly and getting credit for open work, et cetera, et cetera. Our policies don't stand up, but it's not just us. This is pretty much true for most universities. The angel policies of IP and the policies of how people get promoted and tenured and so on and so forth. There's a mismatch there. And so what we have is, you know, our suggested best practices. And will we be able to move those someday into policy? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe, um, maybe best practices are enough. You hear a lot from the industrial OSPOs these days. But they really want to be communicating. They're there to support what happens, not be a blocker to what happens. And in a lot of ways, as Saeed demonstrated, faculty can be more prickly about are you being a blocker or are you being a helper? Saeed, agree, disagree? I actually muted you guys, go for it. <laughs> I think you did. Yeah, I think that it's a little, I mean, why did you just directly answer uh, this question? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 think the, I think the main theme I'm trying to get at, so just, just one thing, it's true at Hopkins and Carnegie Mellon as well, students own their own IP unless they're directly funded by a grant, which may have stipulations from the, the funder and so on. I, I think the main message that I'm trying to get out is that the faculty understand, um, they believe that this is a primary research output and they're, they're trying to do their best in terms of sharing it and building community and so on. Um, but they don't always understand the implications of what they're doing. So we, we can talk a lot about the possibilities and benefits, we should, but let, let, make no mistake, there are people in university administration who are very worried about the risks of doing this and the security implications. Of doing this. So there are a lot of things which I do agree in that sort of corporate setting. Maybe we can learn a lot of those kinds of things, right? Companies have done this. And they have a different IP policy regime and they have you know, different types of contributors. I get all that. Um, but rather than coming at it from the risk perspective, can we come at it from the benefit perspective first of what it means to disseminate the outputs of the university and then think about those first dimensions. Right, you know, fully, fully agreed. My VP of research, you know, his first response in me wanting to set this up was, oh, thank God, you can finally help us with compliance. Uh, no, <laughs> you should hire someone to do compliance. You should have your existing IT people do compliance. I will introduce you to folks who will help you with compliance. I, I will not be the compliance guy. Not, not my main focus, my main interest, no. But it's important. I agree with you that it's important. License compliance, security compliance, all of those is key, but they're not right. So in, in our case, you know, the key challenge that we uh, are focusing on is to 
you know, also try to find out where are those interesting open source projects within the university. In fact, the whole UC system, right? And Stephanie and I, we're just a two person team. So, you know, we, we took on a big project, but we also realized that there are actually ways to scale this up without having uh, us do all the work, right? And so we took a, a note of the Google Summer of Code, uh, the way it's organized and set up. And you can actually, you know, have big programs that are distributed and where the work is actually distributed over many people um, uh, with relatively little effort. I mean, I'm, I'm actually carefully choosing my words because I've been mean, working it's off the job, but, <laughs> but it's, it's possible, right? It, it's, it's something that, um, uh, it, and I think finding those programs that scale over 10 campuses potentially uh, that actually require relatively little administration and uh, that leverage a lot of resources and a lot of interests um, to actually find those projects that really want to, you know, use open source to 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 uh, to to promote or to um, to to move forward research. Um, those are the important projects for us, right? So it's I don't I'm not that interested to find every open source piece that. Uh, and uh, research are put on, on GitHub. I'm interested in those that actually have real activity where, you know, where let's say junior faculty is really uh, uh, using that as, uh, as a foundation for her or his tenure career. Um, and those are the ones that we want to uh, find and want to find ways to support. And I think there's, you always, every program that we try to figure out um, needs to have sort of a very strong incentive to participate. Um, universities are possibly the place where, you know, the, you can, you cannot really use a stick. Uh, it, there's, there's just really no way of doing that. Um, but you, there's, if you find the carrots, right, there's enormous pressure to be successful in a university and you pretty much use any help you can and if we find ways to effectively help uh, research groups, uh, they will do work really hard to participate. And we have uh, experienced that. So um, yeah, the next challenge that we're trying to address is uh, really finding all those funding streams. So we have one way to find open source projects, but we need to sort of tap into the overall funding uh, streams that exist and, and kind of figure out the open source part. And uh, we haven't quite figured out how to do that. We, we got some you know, kind words from various administrations that they will uh, help us, but it's extra work for them. It's not, you know, that's not gonna necessarily work. What we need to find is ways to, to really make faculty interested to let us know um, uh, those things and that's sort of our those are the kinds of challenges we're, we're, we're working on it's very much like a, um incentives you know trying to find incentive hacks uh, mm -hmm. to, to get something done so what we're able to do with the, the funding we got from the sloan foundation was to set up a fellowship program and traditional fellowships tend to mean at least in a faculty mind the the traditional research fellowship you get internally from your university is like, here's some money to hire one student for one semester to do a thing. And it's not the only case, but it's, it's a fairly common case. And we were able with Liz and Josh's support to provide these fellowships that provided um, a team of students. So we were able to work with faculty who had work, who wanted to put their stuff out openly, and try to start to build a community around it, we were able to, to mentor 25 projects over two years, where we could give them, you know, depending on what their needs were, X number of weeks or months to do 
the kind of digging into their project to find out who their users were and what the project was and where they were trying to draw people from and what support they needed to build them milestones and roadmaps and help them set up some initial software architecture or websites or whatever they needed to kind of go out and do the work to try to get that, that participation. You know, right. after we've done that, it's still on them, but at least we were able to help them start. I'm going to take a moment and ask, because I know we started a little late. How much time do we have left? I don't want to encroach on that. Maybe about 10 more minutes? Probably. 10 more minutes. Okay, great. Well, you know, there are several questions that I had for you, and I, you know, I'll take some of those offline. I know I will see you all <laughs> in other settings, but maybe um, so we leave room for questions from the audience. I'll just have one more question, um, which could be maybe quick, is where in your institution is your, your OSPO? Where is it housed? How did it end up there? And if you had to give someone advice who was gonna to try to copy you, what would you say to them? I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, so uh, in both cases, the OSPO that I've led is in the university libraries. Um, the advice or the reason for that is we've argued that this is a curation problem, right? That if, if we can curate and manage the software, open source software produced within an institution, um, prepare it better for, for reuse, sharing, and so on. That is in, an incredibly useful way to work within the university. We've been talking a lot within the university, but particularly externally. And I'll give one clear example, which is the federal funders, uh, and I would suspect the private ones like Sloan, who are spending a lot more time thinking about open data and the new OSTP uh, memorandum that came out stresses that but we'll increasingly think about software. So institutions that are better prepared to say, we have a policy and a, a, an infrastructure and well curated software will be in a better position to compete for those dollars. Yeah, I think um, I have, um, I think the uh, open source is actually a large enough area where I think that it's not just a curation problem, although I, I do agree that it's a big, a, a big part of it. But I think there is this entire discipline of research software engineering. Um, uh, and I don't think they see themselves as curators, but they see themselves as sort of, you know, the practitioners of, of and bring in industrial level uh, uh, practices of software engineering as it is relevant for our research. Now, the interesting thing is that there is actually quite a bit of overlap with reproducibility, which is also a curation problem. <laughs> and so, um, but the technologies of reproducibility are not actually traditionally with libraries, right? They are, they are traditionally with, with industrial software engineering. And if you look at sort of the recent advances of, you know, DevOps, for instance, great example, right? How it vastly accelerated the development cycle uh, of, of, of deployments. Um, there is actually an argument to be made that you can use the same mechanisms to also vastly accelerate the, uh, the, 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 the delivery of science. And, um, and, and, you know, there's, it, there are some differences, but I think there is, that's why I'm thinking it's, I think that the core discipline of, um, of an OSPO, right, is, is, is got to be software engineering, closely, you know, targeted towards the needs of research and how to amplify, you know, the, research in, in various domains. And so I'm thinking it is really situated in my mind um, uh, where I would like to be is in the Office of Research. So I'm very envious of, 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 of RIT who, who managed to do that. Um, and uh, I like to be sort of, you know, between three institutions within the Office of Research, right? Which is university relations, I think that's part of office of research. I'm not sure. It's um, 
research development, and it's the IP department, not the legal department. Um, and university relations uh, is interesting because it is really uh, a lot of the potential of open source is really this outreach component. Um, and, you know, whether it's to uh, open source stakeholders, uh, industry, you know, outside people who have actually a stake in the research that's being done. And uh, in some sense, it's, you know, um, how do you uh, manage convergent, convergence research? Uh, and, you know, but you work with communities outside the university. So it's, um, but it's also research development because it's, you know, it's really about funding. Um, how do you, um, you know, how do you make sure that, that these open source efforts um, are encouraged by, by greater engagement with industry and foundation and so forth? Um, We've certainly seen this happening ever since we, we started the OSPO and, and CROSS, that certain proposals were much more successful because of the background that we have. Um, so the posts, uh, the recent post pathways to open source, to enable open source ecosystems and its effort in our call, would have been not possible without our experience in CROSS and, 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 and gospel to respond to um, and now you know we suddenly are in a position and we are pretty much the only ones at the university who can respond to them right. and maybe the genomics uh, the people from the genomics institute they could also respond to that. right. but it's it's sort of funny that these these um, really there are sort of gaps in the university like UC Santa Cruz um, that need to be filled badly. Um, Danny, Kendall, SJ, do you, do you have a response or do you want to offer where your institutional home is? I can do a um, I can add that uh, I'm located physically, like in the library, I'm in an office in the library. Um, and we're also connected to the College of Engineering Mathematics and Statistics as part of the Complex Systems Lab. So it kind of like straddle two things. I think the library is useful because I can go to, you know, I've talked to seven, seven different colleges inside of the university and I can use that as like, I'm a neutral party in that sense. Like I'm not coming from one college coming to you from this college. Like there's the, it kind of negates some of the, the politics that might be involved with that. Although honestly, everyone's been really good about it. Um, I think it's kind of interesting because I'm not sure where it does belong in the long term. Like there's aspects of the, you know, vice president office of research that's really inter interesting. But I think there's a lot, a lot of this is like, it's not even just about research. It's about teaching people how to work well with each other <laughs> and making things. And it's like the research is a byproduct of that. Um, and if they get that piece, if we teach them that piece, then the, what's going to come out is going to be much better, much faster, much more innovative, innovative, much more diverse. Um, so like how we do that teaching, I think is kind of part I'm trying to figure out. Um, and I'm so far from knowing the answers to it too, which is the good part. All right, so to kind of touch on everybody, right? Um, I dropped my charter in the, it's now an outdated charter, but I dropped my charter into the chat because, because we came out of education um, and out of the college of computing, even that's murky because we're, I came out of the video game program, right? So we're not traditional computer science, video games are very collaborative. The provost and the vice president of research not in a kind of competitive way, but really had to put some thought into should we be in the um, should we be on the org chart under the provost or under the VPR? They ended up with the VP. Um, but our the the people that we touch in the in the discussion of like software, et cetera, the projects we mentored covered everything from computational astrophysics to um, deaf literacy to Victorian autobiography. And um, so that's all over the place. Just to add to the discussion about the libraries, I dropped another link in the chat for something called Helios Open, which is an effort from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics, which is to push the larger open science, open data, open, open, open stuff, right? 
there's a, a representative anointed by a president from all of the member universities, and easily a third of the people anointed by the presidents are the directors of libraries, because in a lot of places, due to OER or to data, right, those initiatives started in the libraries. So it's it's a very kind of where do you belong and where do you fit? You know, it's, it, you really have to end up working across everything, no matter where you're housed. But being in the Magic Center, I have one of the most colorful and coolest offices anywhere. So. <laughs> I, I can it attest to cool. that. Yeah. yeah. And what about uh, um, Dan? Uh, so we are actually housed under the Computer Science Department, which is part of a brand new uh, restructured School of Science and Engineering. Um, it was a moved out of the College of Arts Sciences. Um, and we've got a little bit of support from the uh, OVPR, but there are definitely challenges with being part of the computer science department. We try to be as inclusive as possible. And I think the the concerns that, that Steve mentioned about identifying the source in open source um, is, is definitely a cognitive roadblock for some people. Um, they, I've tried talking with people across the university um, and we've gotten requests for support for developing different pieces of software from people from across the university. But some departments uh, in my initial listening tour just to kind of get to know everybody and make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and what we can do for them, uh, where we want to grow, and the kind of relationship we want to have. Um, I have not heard back from some departments yet. Um, some of them a little surprising to me. Um, so I think finding some sort of cross-cutting university-wide um, identity or organization that, that we would fit under would probably in the long run be a better place for us to be. The libraries, I think, are an interesting um, dimension of that. And I've just reached out to our library people early on, and they were very excited to have a conversation with me. Um, they were, in fact, enthusiastic that other people were looking at uh, parts of open scholarship generally that they've been trying to raise flags about for a while. Um, so that was that was pretty cool and um, encouraging to know that um, there are allies everywhere in the university sometimes uh, putting up the long fight and not always getting as much attention for it. So. Yeah, and um, in the interest of time, maybe I'll ask now if there, Stephanie, are there any questions from the audience or if you haven't typed them out, um, any from the in-person audience over there? I haven't seen any on chat. One from Alex? Uh, so thank you everybody for this great overview of OSPOS, uh, right? I saw have a question immediately, right? How are you guys connect? Is there a meta layer? where all the OSPOS can communicate and what can we use it for? So I, I, give, I give an example. So uh, we started a new initiative for open source science. Uh, I'm at IBM, IBM is a partner of NonFocus. So NonFocus is a nonprofit home of Jupyter, Pandas, and all the data science, for data science software. So we'd like to basically look at stand interest groups in different disciplines to bring together scientists around astronomy, chemistry, biology, and so forth. And you guys look like you're the boots on the ground. You're the universities, your eyes and ears of open source in academia. Can we like use you guys as communication channels? Can we engage with you to disseminate, you know, things like let's get together and map sciences to open source software discipline by discipline. Let's consider reproducibility as a cross-cutting concern. Let's right. So so uh, what are the how do you guys envision uh, your community as a layer? right between open source community in general and science in particular so i'll, I'll put in another plug i guess um <laughs> for, for gospel plus plus that is that is precisely what it has been formed to do um, is to think about the sort of network of ospos and what are the kinds of things a network of ospos can do particularly around academic and sort of government types of, of activities so um if you are interested in bringing that uh, we would love to set up a session. We've talked about having a session focused on open science, for example, and mm -hmm. I think this fits into that. Um, so that would be a great place to not only see the people around the hospitals, but invite the researchers and the faculty we know and the funders and maybe even other people from the public sector who would be interested in 
there, there's a lot of participation from uh, people in the private sector as well in those groups. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, we're, um, did anybody have any last minute? Because we are running into. I want to. I want to just add really quickly to Alex's question. Um, so also, we have a pretty good connection to the TV group, right? Which is the um, industry possible umbrella organization. And I think that um, I cannot speak for the to do group because I'm not really that plugged in, but I think that, you know, we have some people here that, you know, Anissia, for instance, who, who is very familiar with the work of the to do group. And, um, and I think that would be, I think, I know that they're very interested in connecting with the academic aspects mm -hmm. as well. Um, how they, you know, their the focus is, is industry driven, right? And so we've seen already in the discussions today that there are some differences. Um, uh, while for science, reproducibility is a really big concern, right? For industry, maybe compliance is a bigger concern. And so, um, so although compliance could also become a bigger concern once we be mature in, 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 the, in the universities. Um, so it's, but I think, you know, that I think there are, at least two umbrella organizations that that can connect things. I think Stephen has to go. So if you if you hit the to do group page, there'll be an oxology session, which is their kind of monthly meeting, October fifth, on bridging um, with the chaos group, the chaos group that does the software community health assessment open source software that they're looking at doing more with academic metrics. I'm on the, the steering committee of the to do group and I'm part of the chaos value group and we've been kind of bringing those things together. So there's an opportunity. Um, we will have in roughly a month, God willing, and the crick don't rise um, videos and transcripts from everything that happened on the summit on open work in academia. And that group wants to keep working that's one that brought together um, industry academics uh, government funders and philanthropy funders and try to find a way to continue that work so we'll be putting more of that out there um, there's like a discourse group discussion group set up but i don't know what that is at the moment um, so there you go also sustained and great work not exclusively on academia but should be checked out as well. Awesome. And I was really thrilled to see the um, all the links that are in the chat. And, and I'm sure there's a lot to launch off of um, for follow up conversations. So I want to thank everyone here, um, especially the panelists and sharing your knowledge. And then I hope we get to talk more soon. Get all the chat, the uh, traffic. Um, in our notes so everybody who's here who wasn't following it can, can keep along but we're gonna take a 10 minute break so a little little um a little run in a little late but that should give us enough time to get hydrated and um take cookies and then nifia will talk we'll wrap up our, our as our last keynote for today all right thanks to all the panel bye guys bye everybody